They will never scrutinize the mattress, they say. Boom, <laughs> new entropic paper. Decomposing language models into understandable components. Monotonicity has been achieved internally. Take that open air. <laughs> this is a kind of a different format where I am going to go through the paper, Carpati style, Neil Nanda style, Yannick Kilsner style, whatever you want. I, I, I'm going to try a new format where I just go through a paper and I haven't read the paper fully. I've, I've, I've skimmed through it. I've, I found some stuff interesting. And I hope you learn something as I learn something while, while going through the paper as well. So what happened is Anthropic released this new blog post saying they composing language models into unestimable components. And at the end, they say, for the first time, we feel that the next primary obstacle to interpreting large language models is engineering rather than science. So basically, interpretability might be solved. Entropic was investing in make interpretability for so long and they, they didn't have any like clear results of managing to like interpret like individual neurons, right? This was a blog post, um, but they actually have an actual paper, which is kind of the same format as this still. It's mostly like HTML paper. It's beautiful. There's like a lot of visualization. Highly recommend to look at it. Towards the monosemanticity, decomposing language models with dictionary learning. So the, the way they do it is they use a sparse autoencoder and they extract a large number of interpretable features from a one layer transformer. So if you've never seen a autoencoder, it looks, it looks something like this. You have the encoder, in, encoder phase and then the decoding phase. And the thing is, before that, we were not able to understand what was going on if we just had this like self-attention thing plus an MLP with an, a nonlinear activation. And in this paper, they show that you can actually figure out what's going on. But before that, we were only able to like figure out what's going on in the self-attention part, right? So this is pretty cool. And so this is this whole thing here on the left is, is what we call one layer transformer. What they do is they, they look at these activations, this 512. So this is just like the number of neurons that are activated. And they do this uh, autoencoder thing to get these features. And they say it is like autoencoder they use is part and over complete. So it's important to like look at it um, a little bit. So instead of having this thing here, which is like a small number here on the left, they got like 512 and here they have a bigger thing in the middle. Okay. It's sparse, which means that they use some penalization to make sure that the values are not too high and over complete. There's more features than there is like inputs or outputs. The way to look at it is because of this like normalization, you make sure that even if you have more neurons here in the middle, the representation still is forced to be kind of like compact and elegant because of the normalization. Otherwise it will, it, it, it will not work out so well. Now you might like not really understand how this is kind of like a dictionary learning and, and, and all these things. So um, a fun thing to do is to ask Claude. <laughs> so you, you ask your transformer about it. So I was like, what do they mean here? Why do they refer to the decoder as, as a dictionary? And actually, if you look at the, at the weights, WD, so the decoder thing, it's actually a dictionary of vectors. So if we go back here, it's like your vocabulary, like the, the new features you have, like imagine you have like 4,000 features here. So it's basically having 4,000 words where this kind of like way of, of looking at the data, make sure you can regenerate the rest of the data, right? So the, the concepts of the thing that, that these features encode is like what they find in the in the paper. So like those features, for instance, are stuff like legal language, DNA sequences, nutrition, sports, um, things like that. To go back to the main points about monosemanticity versus polysemanticity, previously they had something where if you look at the at some at some specific neuron in your in your MLP activation, it like fires on like Korean, HTTP stuff, LaTeX stuff, Japanese stuff. But now with all those like 4,000 features, it's, it's just fires on, on one specific thing, which is those DNA sequences, right? And this is much more interpretable. This is much better. This is much more interesting and much more useful for, for interpreting those larger number of models. Like, and, and so this is just like one feature that they had. But if you want to explore most, most of them, they have this like dictionary learning features. This is an important thing about notations is you can, you, you can go through all their tests that, that they have numbered from like zero to 29 to even like thousands of, of numbers and all the runs are, are different like parameters. And so here you, you can look at, um, 
different parameters for the L1 coefficient, so the, the, the sparsity thing, and the number of features learned. So the dimension of your hidden layer if you're in your autoencoder. And the one that is the best one apparently is A1. That's why it's highlighted in the paper. So if you click on it, you can see all the different things that are the most interesting. So for instance, here are the like DNA things it activates for math. Like we see that this is like symbols that are related to math and LaTeX and <laughs> the negative things are kind of funny sometimes. It's like about like making money. So it's kind of donations and fee and taxes, which is like kind of like the opposite of a very abstract math. So now that we've seen this kind of A1 layer, you have this kind of cluster-ish things. So you have CSV, sports, nutrition, all those kind of things. They actually have a different uh, visualization in their paper where you can just like click through um, one of these. Let's say you click on war. <laughs> if you zoom in war, it will be kind of like a lot of things. Um, border, voting, road. I'm not sure if those are kind of related, but you, you see the the A1 number here. It's, it's referring to this... Um, like run that we've talked about, A1, and they have a number for each feature. Most of them are kind of like interpretable and they're grouped in some kind of cluster. So you have like hundreds of, of cluster that kind of makes sense. They also have uh, some visualization here with different runs. So A0 is, um, is when you have only 500 features, which is you don't actually have this over complete thing. We just, you just have the same number of, of features in the middle. It's more like the features from that were actually in your MLP from the, from the beginning. A1 is the thing we care about and A2 is more features. And so the more features you have, the more granular your cluster will be, like the smaller they will be. And, and so for instance, they have these things with uh, Arabic script features or, or base 64. And so if you, if you zoom in, you can actually see that the, those clusters they break out into smaller clusters. So the A0 break out into smaller A1, but that break out into smaller A2. So this is very exciting because it means that you can get more granularity as you increase the number of features. So so now we can go to the to the actually fun stuff. So since this is kind of like exciting, um on their on their less wrong post, which is the same as the blog post, I asked a question about like what are they doing to try on next? What's the like, how would you know if, if, if your thing actually works? Like, have you done the tests and how would they know if, if they succeeded? And they said that their next goal is Cloud Instant or Cloud 2. And to know if they succeeded, they would basically uh, check if uh, the thing they said about what makes a good composition is true. So I think this is kind of important is, is how to make sure that they actually have something that is useful and, and meaningful and, and not just like a pretty thing. So the three goals for them is you can understand why a feature is, is, is active. So what causes a feature to, to activate? So in this case, we do have like these things like Arabic, Hebrew, DNA, etc. that are very like interpretable. So we know what caused a feature to be active, which is pretty cool. Something about knowing the downstream effects of each feature. If you change the value of, of a feature, what does it change on the next layers? And then something about making sure that the features you, you've extracted, they explain a large fraction of your MLP layer. And I think they kind of like nail most of these points. So the, the first one we talked about and for the downstream effects, they have another test they made where they have a sequence of digits and they manually add the, the feature that corresponds to some stuff. So like Chinese, base 64 DNA, etc., and they get to change exactly how they want the output. So it, it, it really means that this feature have some like causal effects if you, if you add them to your uh, residual stream. And then to like explain a portion of your MLP layer, they have something where they looked at how much of the log likelihood loss you, you reduce if you use the features instead of the MLP activations. You only lose 20% of information somehow or, or, or loss reduction by you doing this auto encoder thing, which means that we kind of like understood a, a lot of, of the information that was inside it. There are like other, other things that are kind of interesting. I could go quickly. So the coolest one is that features connect in a finite state automata, like systems implement complex behaviors. So here, what's happening is we have like all these features like base64, uppercase, French, etc. And 
what's interesting is they 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 look at different things and they also predict something else after this was kind of like in, difficult for me to understand at first but um let's say you have something that that looks at those brackets here and and whenever this this thing is triggered the whenever this feature is triggered there's something else in the rest of the transformer uh, processing that says, hey, we need to look for tag name after, right? The the footer thing here, or it could be a UL or whatever. So that's what we mean by um, predicting tag names is there's something that fires here and then something that predicts that the next thing is, is going to be what this other feature is firing on. So it's basically like whenever this thing is triggered, something in the Indian states is, is changed and that tells the, the next token to look for a tag name. Then this thing is triggered and it tells the other one, increase the probability that through Eden state that the next one will be identified as a closing tag, etc. So basically you have this like pattern of, of different features that act as some automata for detecting like patterns in, in text data. So this is what you have when you have like some automata in general and you're trying to see like how do you write patterns that can match those kind of things. And this is basically what's happening here for like HTML code. So this is very exciting because it, it, it enables us to like, like see what, what humans would like write as language automata in, inside of transformers. So if, if those features are correct and, and, and we can, and they actually talk to each other like, like they do here, this would enable a lot of things that are kind of very interesting. If you enjoy this kind of content, tell me in the comments, uh, if I should do more, I will probably try to look at more papers if I find them exciting. And uh, yeah, if you're someone on a tropic like watching this video and, and would want to uh, would want to, to, to sponsor future future paper uh, walkthroughs, uh, feel free to reach out.